Hey, we're in our series we're calling Upside Down Christmas. Uh, last week, Rob Basham got us started as we uh, talked about this idea that you know, we have a God who keeps his promises, but oftentimes we find ourselves uh, in the waiting rooms of life. And Rob talked to us about the fact of the life of Simeon, that he was given a promise that he would one day see the Messiah. And that moment came, and Rob talked about our, our call to be watchmen, to pay attention to what God is doing, as well as a call to be steadfast. And um, so I, he got a great launch for us in, the, in this series. And uh, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 1. You can grab your Bibles and go to Matthew chapter 1. I'll be reading that text here in a, just a little bit. Um, but, you know, I, let me just confession, I, I, I like easy. I like it when things go smooth. I like things that are just very convenient, and um, my guess is that you do as, uh, as well. Some of you may remember the, the, the advertisement that was uh, by Staples, the, you know, the easy button. Um, they, they ran an ad during the Super Bowl where uh, you could, uh, there's a show this kid in, in math class, and he, a very difficult math question is being asked of him, and, and then it, it transitions to, uh, to a dad who has twin boys in front of him whose diapers need to be changed. Uh, and, and, and then it, it transitions again, and then you find yourself in a surgical room, and there are people all masked up, and they got their gown up, and they're ready to perform, a, uh, this doctor's ready to perform a surgical procedure that he's never done before. He just smacks the easy button. Ah, no problem. I got this. As does the dad, as does the kid in the math class. And I, I like easy. I like things. I mean, I like simple things like, you know, like Uber, Uber Eats. I like, you, know, you can do so much on your app. You can, you can, you can file for a mortgage alone on, on, your, on your phone these days. Things are easy. Some of you are old enough to remember that when you would go on a road trip, you actually had to purchase a map. You would go to a gas station and you would just kind of select a map and you had maybe you had a catalog of maps uh, in your glove, de- uh, glove compartment. Um, and again, some of you may remember these things called Thomas Guide maps. Um, you, you, like if you were going to a major city, you, you bought the map for that city and it was a big, big map zoomed out. But then if you wanted to go somewhere in the city, you had to find like it had letters across the top. You had numbers down the side and you would find like maybe it was G7 is the neighborhood you're going to. And you'd have to get a paper and a pen and write your directions out. And that took a little bit of work, uh, but that's how you navigated. And, and then this amazing thing called MapQuest came out and you just put in the address you want to go and it actually would do all that work for you well now it's easy now you just tell Siri this this is where I want to go and you'll get directions uh, you know on your phone or in your car about how to get there and you can choose what accent you want those directions to be given to you in it can British accent because that's comforting I mean it's like having Sam Brown in the car with you Uh, or any other accent you can choose to be guided to your destination I like I I like easy my guess is you like easy as well Uh, Brian Kendall was having a conversation with me this last week about how he just kind of wants to work out a little bit. He feels like he just needs to put on some muscle. He'd like, he'd like, he'd like to get ripped. He'd like that, that six pack. And, and yet he, he was telling me that he just doesn't really want to do all the hard work to do it. And he, but he figured a solution out. He's, he's been wearing this t-shirt uh, around the, the office and I think he paid like 12 bucks for it. That, that's easy. That's when you can take that picture off the screen because that's disturbing. Um, but it, we like easy. And, and, And here's the thing, though. As much as we love ease, and and there's nothing wrong with that, when it comes to following Jesus, following Jesus can can be difficult. It It can be really difficult. In fact, that's sort of my main idea of the day. Following Jesus is difficult. And we'll see that quite clearly from the story that we're reading in the Christmas story in Matthew chapter 1. I want to read verses 18 to 25. And then really what I want to, want to lay out for us is just three, three aspects of why this journey was difficult for Joseph and Mary. We'll, we'll play those out. We'll talk about how they relate to us. But, but then we'll end with, the, the, I think, two things that sustain them in the difficulty of their journey. Three difficulties they experienced in the journey and two things that sustain them along the way. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. For he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, and she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born, and Joseph named him Jesus. This is God's holy word. Friends, following Jesus is difficult. It's difficult, and it was difficult for Joseph and Mary. And I think you've, you've heard teaching about Jewish customs of the day, especially as it relates to weddings and marriage. And you've heard me talk about the idea that when, a, when, a, when a, a, an engagement takes place, that there's a covenant that's signed, and, and there's a waiting period. The, the, the husband-to-be goes to his father's house to prepare a room for his new bride, and, uh, and, and then at some undisclosed time, then the husband will come and, and take his wife to be with him. This period of waiting was also, as some, some scholars will tell us, that this period of waiting was also a test of purity for the wife-to-be. That, that if, in fact, she was impure, this waiting period actually would reveal perhaps a potential pregnancy. Interesting that there's no test of purity for the husband, but that's a whole other conversation. But in this time of waiting, Mary and Joseph are engaged is really where we get, we get this, this understanding that, you know, following Jesus is difficult. Be- because, because Mary is, a, she has an angel appear to her and she's told the Holy Spirit's going to overshadow her. Luke captures that account of the story. And, and then she has to let her husband-to-be know, Joseph, would, wouldn't you love to have been there when Joseph got that text message? Hey, Joe, um, so here's the deal. An angel appeared to me and told me that the Holy Spirit was going to hover over me and um, conceive in me a child, and he would be the Messiah, take away the sins of the world. So I just wanted to let you know that I'm pregnant. Joseph obviously does not buy it. He doesn't buy this Christmas. It's a Christmas miracle. He doesn't buy it, and we know that. How It wasn't a text message. But however it was communicated, Joseph doesn't believe it, but he's, he's, he's not going to throw Mary under the bus. He's not going to do some kind of Facebook post. He's not going to do an Instagram story. He's just going to quietly divorce her because once you're engaged, that's considered you're married in those days. And he, he's just going to just, he's going to let her go. But then he has an angelic visitation and he's told, no, it's true. That in fact, the spirit of God is going to hover, has hovered over your future wife, Mary, and she is pregnant. She is pregnant with the Messiah. Now, your name is child Jesus. And, but Joseph has a decision to make, doesn't he? Is he going to buy it? Is he going to believe it? We know he does. We know he does take Mary to be his wife. We know all that, but, but we miss out on the tension in that moment if, if he's going to believe because he's going to make a decision and it's going to be a difficult decision because it is a call to radical obedience. It's a call to radical obedience that comes with a price because everyone in that community, the moment that Joseph says yes to Mary, who's already pregnant, what he is doing is he's confessing that that child is his. And a cloud of shame is going to hang over them. In fact, some would say when you get to John chapter 8, verse 41, when the Pharisees are in debate with Jesus, they make a comment saying that we're not illegitimate children. Some, just a few scholars say that that's actually a jab at Jesus, that his birth story is known, that, that some would, would say that the cloud of shame is still ha- hanging over that family. Joseph does it. Their reputation is being tarnished. And by the way, can we just acknowledge that Mary probably has dreams of her, her whole life. It's, 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 she's young, but she has dreams of her wedding day. Just like many of us had dreams of our wedding. Or you're dreaming of your wedding day perhaps one day. 
that it, this is gonna, it's going to look this certain way. And in those days, it was an entire week-long ceremony. And it's very likely that never happened. It was a quiet wedding. And many people looked at them as that young couple whose passions got a hold of them, that young couple from the youth group that who just, you know, they, they couldn't wait. And yet, Joseph and Mary knew the real story, and it was a radical call to obedience. And that same radical call to obedience is upon us. It, it's upon, do you remember 100-year anniversary? Uh, we, we were here, we commissioned a young couple to go as international workers to Kosovo. Grant and Dakota Shaw, they graduated from RTI, they were sent out by, by our movement, the Christian Missionary Alliance, and they are in Kosovo today. Did they go to Kosovo because they loved to travel? They, they might love to travel, they might enjoy traveling, but they're not in Kosovo because they love to travel. Did they go to Kosovo because they love Kosovar food? I hope they like Kosovar food. They're going to be eating a lot of it. But they didn't go to Kosovo because they love the food. They went to Kosovo because a call of God was on their life so strong that they would actually leave family, uproot themselves from a known place where they have lived their entire lives so far, and they are now living in Kosovo because they believe fully in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that there is no other name by which someone may be saved than the name of Jesus. And they want people to hear about Jesus. And it's a radical call of obedience. But you may be hearing that and go, well, well, I mean, yeah, that's what missionaries do. But the same call is on our lives. Let me just highlight a few. It takes a radical obedience to forgive someone who has hurt and wounded you. Doesn't it? It's the last thing you want to do when you've been hurt and wounded. It takes radical obedience to commit to give your tithes and offerings. It takes radical obedience to bless those who insult you. It takes radical obedience to be committed to spiritual community. It takes radical obedience to turn the other cheek. It takes radical obedience to not store your treasure here on earth, but store it in heaven. It takes radical obedience to not give in to to anxious thoughts. It takes radical obedience to not judge one another. I could keep going. These are all from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus preached. It, it's, a, it's not easy. It's not easy, to, it's not easy to forgive. It's not easy to repay evil with good. But that's the call that's on our lives. And this, from the very beginning, is the call on the life of Joseph and Mary, which we just really have to pause for a moment and ask ourselves the question. I'll put it up here on the screen. And the fact, that, is there any arena of my life where obedience is being minimized? Is obedience in any way is going to cause some kind of price for you to pay? That's, the, that's what it was for Joseph and Mary. Look, a cloud of shame was going to hang over them. People were going to look at, at them. And by the way, can we just say the community, the city, the village they lived in, they didn't get an angelic visitation. The angel didn't show up to all their friends and family and say, hey, just want you to know that Joseph and Mary are telling the truth. They, they didn't get that. But they still said yes. And I think that's the response that Jesus is looking for from us. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. So that, that, that's why it's difficult to follow Jesus. It takes radical obedience. Here's the second one. It's a call to self-denial. Matthew chapter 1, verse 25. We'll put it up here on, on the screen. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. Let's hit the pause button there. You ever heard a Christmas sermon on that verse? Because you read it, I read it a little bit earlier, and there's something in this is like, okay, that's weird. Let's keep moving on. Let's get to chapter two. But let's stop for a moment, and let's talk about this. Let's, let's talk about sex. Good, I have your attention. <laughs> let's talk about, because we have to understand, this is a young married couple. And, and what Matthew is telling us, he thinks it's important for us to know this. Which means it's important, God thinks it's important for us to know this. That 
that we would know that there was no sexual activity between the two from the moment they were engaged until the child was born. Which, if you think about being newly married, that, that's self-denial. And these two did not engage in sexual activity in that entire time. Now, think about today and our thoughts on sex and sexual activity. And I mean, it just doesn't go without saying. I mean, there are folks who are not married who are having sex. I was at a football game recently. I happened to be seated behind a young man who had his phone out, who was flipping through his app, swiping right quite a bit on his app, hoping to hook up with, with, with a woman. Uh, there are people who um, are living together and they're not married. There are folks who are married who have gone outside the bounds of their vows. And there are folks who are married who are actually having conversations. I've been a pastor for 25 years, so in, in, these are all scenarios that I'm familiar with. There are also scenarios where people who are married who are discussing the options of an open marriage. And you may be here or you may be watching online or listening to this podcast and going, yep, that's exactly what I expect a pastor to say. Stop it. Can we just pause for a moment, pull back a little bit and say, Jesus is not a killjoy. He actually created sex. He, was a, he, he thought it was a good idea that this, this would be given to us as a gift. But he's also saying that the best way to engage in this gift is in a marriage. He's not a killjoy. He wants this gift to be enjoyed. But he's also saying here's the best way to engage in the gift. And we have Joseph and Mary in this really obscure verse. It's like, uh, it makes us feel a bit awkward. But they deny self. And I wonder if we're here today and, you know, we, we, we probably, there's some of us who maybe engage in sexual sin and God forgives and God redeems. Praise God. But maybe you're in a, in a situation right now that the Spirit of God is saying to you, this is a call on your life to self-denial. And, and friends, self-denial is just not about sex. It's about so many other things in which we're called to deny self and desires on. I've been reading a a book by John Mark Comer. It's called Tell No Lies. And it's a fascinating section of his book when he talks about the mantras of our day. I'd like to read some of it if it's okay. He, He starts by quoting Freud, Sigmund Freud, who says that the suppression of desire is the basis for all neurosis. And really say this is a launching point for the, the, the cultural conversations of our day that really buck up against this idea of self-denial. Comer writes, the reason you are unhappy is that other people are telling you that you cannot do stuff. This has significantly influenced how we live in the West. Freud's ideas show up in the popular slogans and catchphrases of the day. The heart wants what it wants. Follow your heart. You be you. Speak your truth. Just do it. And of course, be true to yourself. Anyone remember Shakespeare from the 10th grade? The catchphrase of our day, be true to yourself, is a modern rendition of a quote from Hamlet. This above all, to thine own self be true. Does anyone remember who said it? Polonius. And in Hamlet, he was the fool. Comer continues and says, It's the fool who encourages you to be true to yourself. And yet today, we repeat this mantra as if it is gospel. Friends, take a look around today. If the suppression of desire is the the root of all neurosis, can we just look at, are, are our lives flourishing? Look, is our world flourishing today? And you can see anxiety levels are off the chart. Depression levels are super high. Suicide is just, it's It's normal now. And I think actually what you could, you could say is the activation, the living out, the following of your heart actually is the root of all neurosis. And it leads back to this clear communication that comes from the word of God in which 
We're called to deny self. Jesus himself said, if anyone wants to follow me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross, and come after me. Because if you try to save your life, you will lose it. If you lose your life, you actually save it. It's upside down. And that's not easy. It's difficult because it's a call to self-denial. And this is what it can look like. Because we give up the right to take revenge, Romans chapter 12. We give up the right to have a comfortable, secure home. It's not wrong to have a comfortable, secure home. I have a comfortable, secure home. But let's not forget that Jesus said, the Son of Man, that what foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. We give up the right to a good reputation, like Joseph and Mary. We give up the right to spend money how we please. We give up the right to hate an enemy, to be honored and served, to understand God's plan before we obey him, Hebrews chapter 11, verse eight. We give up the right to live by our own rules. We give up the right to hold a grudge. We give up a right to complain. We give up the right to put ourselves first. We give up the right to express our sexuality freely. We give up the right to rebel against authority. It's a call to radical obedience and a call to deny self. There was a story told of a young couple who were in a car and they were going to a fast food restaurant. They go to the fast food restaurant, they've made their order and drinks and food and they pull up to the window, you know, the window slides open and the young man who's there hands the drinks first and then hands the sack with the food in it and um, they get their food and they drive away. They go to a park, and they're getting ready to enjoy their, their, their food, and they're, they're in the park, and they're, they're, they got the drinks, and they're drinking, and they open up the bag, and uh, they go to get their food, and as they look in the bag, their food is not there. The bag is full of cash. Someone in the fast food restaurant had wrapped up their shift, taken the cash, emptied their till, and put it in a bag, and this young man who thought he was handing food to this couple actually was handing a bag full of cash. What did they do? They quickly get back in their car, and they drive back to the fast food restaurant. They drive back, they go through the drive through they go to the same young man who gave them the food, and they say, hey, we didn't get our food, you gave us a bag of cash. The young man is astounded that they have come back to return money that they could have just walked off with. Thousands of dollars. He calls his manager, the manager comes to the window, thanks them profusely, and then says, look, we have to tell this story. And the young couple is like, no, actually, we prefer if you didn't tell the story, we really don't want that story told. And the manager says, no, 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 we really need to tell the story. That This stuff doesn't happen today. And the young couple is like, ah, no, I really prefer that the story wouldn't be told. And then the manager insists, look, you don't understand with everything that's happening in our world, this story must be told. It's good news. And the man who's driving the car looks at the manager and says, no, we, you can't go public with this story because the woman I'm with is not my wife. Friends, you may have this part of your life in order, obeying, your relationships are in order, But then over here, there's something funky going on with your finances. Or you you may have this part of your life that you're committed to radical obedience, but there's this other part that you're just, you haven't surrendered. Following Jesus isn't easy. He asks a lot of us. It's a call to radical obedience, and it's a call to self-denial. And as the creator of the universe, he does know what's best for us. So we have to ask the question. Again, we'll put it up here on the screen. Because this isn't just a story that's meant to be read from centuries ago. It impacts us today. Is there any arena of my life where I'm refusing to deny self? Matthew thinks it's important that we know that they deny their sexual desires. Could that be the arena? Maybe you're engaged. Could I say to you, the best gift that you could give to each other is to wait until your wedding day? Is there any arena, dimension, part of your heart that isn't fully surrendered to Jesus? 
Because following Jesus is difficult. It's a call to radical obedience, a call to self-denial. Last thing is simply this. It's a call to embrace discomfort and suffering. A call to embrace discomfort and suffering. Uh, Merry Christmas, by the way. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> we take you back to the temple. The dedication of Jesus. Rob talked about this last week. Simeon and Anna are there. They've been steadfast watchmen. And then here's what we read. Put the words up on the screen from Luke chapter 2. This is the baby dedication. This is what Simeon says to Mary. This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall and many others to rise. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your very soul. I want you to hear what Simeon is saying to this young mom. This is a baby dedication. Your son will cause the rise and fall of many. The rise means many will turn to him. Many will believe that he is indeed the son of God. He is the Messiah. And they will know the gift of salvation. Yet many will reject him. They will fall. There will be division in the community in which you live, in the nation in which you live, and it's all going to be because of your son. It's an external suffering. And yet it isn't just going to be external. You're actually going to feel it internally because a sword is going to pierce your soul. Your emotions are going to take a shot. Mary has no idea about a cross. She, did, she can't picture that yet. But she'll see it. And a sword will pierce her. Internal suffering. Friends, following Jesus is not easy. It's difficult because it's a call to discomfort and suffering because of our association with Jesus. You, you, you might know the name um, John Bunyan. I've been focusing all week not to say Paul Bunyan. Um, John Bunyan, Puritan pastor, preaching, and is imprisoned for his preaching. When he's in prison, he, he does some, some writings. One of the writings he does is a book called Pilgrim's Progress. I think it's the number two best-selling book in, in history. Number one is the Bible. I think number two is, is Pilgrim's Progress. It's a great read. But Bunyan, while he is in prison, writes some of his thoughts. Listen to the discomfort, listen to the pain, listen to the suffering as he writes. He says, the parting with my wife and poor children have oft been to me in this place, he's in prison, in this place as the pulling of the flesh from my bones. I have often brought to my mind the many hardships, miseries, and wants that my poor family has had to meet with, especially my poor blind child who lay nearer my heart than all I had besides. If ever I would suffer rightly, I must first pass a sentence of death upon everything that can properly be called a thing of this life, even to reckon myself, my wife, my children, my health, my enjoyments, and all as dead to me and myself as dead to them. Sound harsh? Listen to the words of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. One day when large groups of people were walking along with him, Jesus turned and told them, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one owns, one's own self can't be my disciple. Anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. Some of your Bible translations will say, if you can't hate your father, mother, children, and so on, it, I think the New Living Translation captures it. It means it's about priorities. Can't let go of that for my sake. You're not fit for the kingdom. Because following Jesus is difficult. It's being willing to embrace discomfort and suffering because of your association with him. And that's what Joseph and Mary did. They followed, even though it was painful. Let's throw this question up on the screen. Are you willing to be uncomfortable and even be in pain because of Jesus? Friends, it's not easy. 
I hope there's seasons when it's easy. I hope when there's seasons when the wind feels like it's at your back. I, I hope there's times that, that that's the case, but we have to prepare ourselves. It's a call to radical obedience. It's a call to self-denial. It is a call to embrace discomfort and suffering because that is the path our Savior walked in. How did they do it? How did Joseph and Mary do all that in their day? Real quickly as I wrap up, two ways I think that happens. First way is simply this. I think that they remember the sign. I think when they were hitting all these roadblocks, I think when they were taking on that cloud of shame, I think when their reputation was tarnished, I think later on even as that happened, they just looked at the child and remembered the prophet Isaiah's word, the virgin shall conceive a child. And she did. And I think that as they were wondering about God's activity in their life, I think they just perhaps remembered this moment, the, the, the virgin conceived a son. The virgin conceived a child. And friends, that was a faith marker for them, and there are faith markers for you. But perhaps, if you can't identify one, perhaps when you're questioning where God, God, where are you, you can simply respond in faith and say, the, the virgin conceived a child. If you're saying, God, why are you letting this happen to me? Don't, don't you care? I think you could, you could take the sign and simply say, the virgin conceived a child. And remember that God is at work. As we find ourselves in the waiting rooms, as you find ourselves on difficult roads. I think they remembered the sign. And I think there are faith markers in your life that you and I need to remember when we hit difficult times. Here's the second thing. I think they anticipated a future joy. They were told that they, had, they, had, they were caring, they were raising this, this son of God who was going to be the Messiah. I don't think that they had in mind the picture of how the Messiah was going to accomplish all he was going to accomplish. I think actually they probably thought similarly to what the disciples thought, that there was going to be a political regime, they were to usher in the golden age of David, and Israel was going to be free from all oppression. I don't think they fully understand it, but they pictured that future moment, and they looked forward to it and anticipated, and that got them through the difficult times and we know for a fact because Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 tells us that that very same thing is what got Jesus through when he was on the cross for the joy set before him he endured the cross he had a picture of a throne room filled with people filled with you in front of him as he was on the cross and he endured it because he knew there would be a moment that you would experience the gift of salvation and you would experience the joy that Adela read about earlier. And so he pushed through. I think that's what Mary and Joseph did and friends, I think that's what we need to remember that there is a future that is ours, that is worth it. Many of you don't know the name Ronald Wayne you do know the name Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Ronald Wayne was one of the three startup owners of this company called Apple that many are very familiar with today. The three of them started the company and Wayne, two weeks into the launch, began to be quite skeptical of the success of this new company. And he also didn't like the thought of having to give so much effort, so he sold his stake in the company two weeks after the launch and earned $800. Today, his stake will be worth $40 billion. Reminds me a little bit of a character in the scriptures, his name was Esau, who in the moment as he faced difficulty, traded away a birthright and an inheritance for a bowl of soup. Friends, there's an inheritance ahead of you. That is unimaginable. You can't even get your head around it. There's a future that is going to usher in so much joy for you that you can't even comprehend. But following Jesus today is difficult because it means being all in, radical obedience. It means denying self because that's what it takes to follow. And it also means that there might be just some discomfort, discomfort and suffering along the way but he's worth it. So press on. And imagine what it would look like if a church were to commit to radical obedience, self-denial, 
embracing discomfort and suffering. Imagine not just this church, not just the, the faces in this room or those who are watching online. Imagine the big C church, not just Salem, not just Oregon, not just the U. I'm talking the world. Imagine a global church following the example of Joseph and Mary and living upside down lives. Imagine the credibility that would be given to this message of the gospel as they live out this following of Jesus. Imagine the harvest that would be there as people see, that, look, look, they're suffering and, and they seem like it's okay. There's something weird going, I need, I need to find it. Imagine what would happen. The many things that we would long for in our lives and in our world, I believe, would begin to take place because faithful followers are imaging this Jesus who came as a baby, went from a cradle to a cross so that you could have a flourishing life. And may that be so for us in this Christmas season. 